Hi, I'm Stephanie Strange. Want to hear something scary? Hello there. I hope you're excited as I am now that we have new videos on the first Tuesday of every month. And we're hoping that we can bring back the weekly videos very, very soon. In addition, I'll be doing email submissions from you guys and making videos out of them on the second week of the month. And I'll be doing monthly live streams again on the last week of every month. When there's not a new video, we'll be doing compilations from our incredible archive of the scariest stories from around the world. So we hope you enjoy. Love can be a very scary thing. This is an old ghost story from Japan about sweet revenge. It was first told in the form of a kabuki play in 1825. There once was a man named Iyamon, who was married to a loving and devoted wife named Oiya. He was a ronin, a samurai who no longer had a master because he had a murderous past. And now, he was a poor umbrella maker. Since they were no longer financially stable, he grew to resent his wife. Then, his neighbor lured him into an evil scheme. My daughter Oume is in love with you. If only you weren't already married, you could be with her and be wealthy beyond belief. Iemon was a garbage human and so he liked the sound of that. And so he started plotting ways to kill his wife. He didn't want to be charged with a murder, so he had to figure out a way to make it look like natural causes. He decided that he was going to poison her. So the next night, they sat at the dinner table together. Then he offered her a spoon. It's medicine to help you get stronger for you and our baby. She was a little hesitant, but poor Oia was so trusting that she took the spoon and drank the poison. At first, nothing happened, but then her hair began to fall out into clumps. Her eyes drooped and began to fill with blood. She fell into a coma, which really pissed Iamon off because he wanted her to die already. Days later, she awoke. She had almost forgotten what had happened, but then she went to the bathroom and saw what she had become. She had lost her beauty and her baby. Iamon still tried to keep up his concerned husband act. Let's go on a walk to your favorite place, he said. So they walked to the edge of a cliff overlooking the entire town. It really was a beautiful view. And while Oia was trying to take it all in with her blood-filled eyes, he pushed her over the edge. Iemon arranged an elaborate funeral for Oia to throw everybody off his scent. But now that she was out of the picture, he began to plan his wedding with his new bride. Now I'll be rich again and everything will be perfect, he thought to himself. Iemon thought he had seen the last of Oia. He could not have been more wrong. He began seeing Oia's distorted face everywhere. She appeared on a lantern and so he shattered it. She appeared in a mirror and he shattered that too. But he wouldn't let Oia ruin his new life with Oume. On the day of his wedding, Oia had not appeared. The ceremony went perfectly. Iemon turned to his new wife, but it was not Oume who looked back at him. It was Oia. He drew his sword and... Everyone stared in horror as the head of Oume rolled down the aisle. Iemon couldn't believe what he had done. He ran outside, out to the edge of the cliff, and cried. The wedding attendants ran after him, just in time to see a woman push him over the edge. Nara and Eli had been dating for only a few months when they decided to go on a last minute vacation to the romantic island of Bali. What better place to celebrate their love while taking in the stunning views and enjoying a slice of paradise? When Nara posted a picture on social media of herself and Eli on the plane, her phone immediately lit up. She groaned as she answered her sister's call. Her sister warned that Nara should not be going to Bali with her boyfriend. Nara brushed this off as jealousy. Her overprotective sibling attempting to protect her from getting too serious too quickly. Her sister was in the middle of warning her about the curse of the temple of when the flight attendant asked Nara to get off the phone, and she hung up. When they landed in Bali, Nara wasn't filled with excitement she was expecting. She was furious at her sister for trying to cast negativity on their vacation. Hoping to forget about the call, Eli asked at the check-in if there were any local legends they should be aware of. 
The greeter nodded and told the story of a prince and a princess from the Brahman caste, the highest in the Hindu order, visiting from the neighboring island of Java. While watching a romantic sunset at the famous Tanalot Temple, the unmarried couple became intimate. Sadly, once their visit was over, the prince refused to marry the princess. Devastated and filled with heartache, she placed a curse on all unmarried couples visiting the Tanalot Temple. It is said that their true love will be forever doomed. Eli started to laugh as this happened many years ago and was just a silly story. But one look at Nara's frown stopped him. During the first few days on the island, Nara found it difficult to enjoy herself. Eli begged her to forget about the call as they headed to camp for the night at the temple. It was a stunningly beautiful rock formation where the waves crashed at the foot of the temple. But the place was practically empty. The lack of noise and visitors gave it an eerie feeling. Nara and Eli barely spoke as they set up their camp that night. The harsh sound of the water bashing against the rocks coupled with the creepy atmosphere kept Nara awake. Eli also tossed and turned, restless in his slumber. Suddenly, he cried out. Waking from a terrible nightmare, he accused Nara of cheating on him. She scoffed and told him how absurd that was, but to him, it felt so real. Nara burst into tears. This is not how she envisioned their perfect romantic vacation going. Feeling resentful, she stormed off towards the water. Then she heard a whisper from behind her. I hate you. She quickly turned around and rushed back towards Eli. How could he just say something so hurtful? Eli protested, claiming he hadn't said anything. Maybe she was hearing things, just like he was dreaming things. Eli reached over to Nara, and when he attempted to put his arm around her, she pushed him away and he stumbled cracking his skull open on a rock as he hit the ground. His twitching body bounced down into the water. Nara cried out in shock, but when she tried to get to him, something stopped her. An unseen force was keeping her body from moving. Then she heard the whispering voice again. He deserved it. They always do. Instead of rushing for help, Nira found herself heading back to the camp. She slept soundly. The following morning, she called the local authorities, pretending to discover Eli was missing. The authorities ruled his death as a tragic accident and chalked it up to tourists who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. But Nara and her sister knew the truth. It was a curse of Bali. The princess ensuring no unmarried couples ever felt happiness again after visiting the temple. But despite her grief, the one question that continually ran through Nara's mind was, would the curse have affected them if her sister hadn't mentioned it? Or would the ghost of the princess have been waiting for them anyway? Arjun, a young Indian man, was tilling his father's crops when a large cobra surprised him in the field. Instinctively, he drove his rake into the snake and killed it instantly. He immediately regretted killing the reptile, but had to finish his work before what the weather reports were saying would be the worst storm of the year. Once the storm hit, everyone in the town of Kimsa sheltered in their homes, including Arjun and his father. Thunder cracked over and over as an unending stream of lightning bolts danced across the sky. Arjun peered out the window and through the heavy sheets of rain saw a young woman wandering the street in front of his house. The wind pushed her about until she fell to the ground and Arjun sprang to his feet and ran outside. He lifted the woman out of the puddles and offered his home as protection until the storm passed. The woman was so grateful for the help. She explained that she had missed her bus and thought she could make her way home before the storm hit. Arjun lit the fire while his father went to make hot tea. Finally, getting a good look at her, Arjun was mesmerized by her beauty. I'm Fatima, she said as her deep brown eyes pierced his soul. The house shook with each boom of thunder, and the lights flickered as the wind picked up speed outside and shook the power lines. Arjun and Fatima lit candles while his father barred the doors and windows. 
The storm was expected to rage for hours, and there would be much destruction to contend with afterwards. Arjun just hoped their house would survive the night. Fatima suggested they play 20 questions to get to know one another. Soon, Fatima learned that Arjun had been working on the farm since he was nine, and Arjun learned that Fatima worked in town and had recently lost her husband. During dinner, Arjun's father went over the young man's chores, and that's when Arjun remembered the snake. Filling his father in on the guilt he felt made the man chuckle. That snake would have ruined the crops. You did the right thing. Let's just hope it wasn't an Ichad Hari Nagin, his father joked. His father explained that if a snake lived for 100 years without doing harm, it became sacred and was granted the power to transform into whatever it wanted. The snake Arjun saw looked like a cobra, and his father asked if he had seen its mate. Arjun shook his head. He hadn't. Then you're fine, because if there's a mate, they are not to be separated. And if one of them is killed, the other will seek revenge. His father jokingly hissed at Arjun and then began cleaning up the plates. Even though he knew his father was teasing him, he still felt worried. Fatima then put her hand on Arjun's. It was only folklore, she said. Arjun relaxed and focused on the fondness he began to feel for his guest. But slowly, Fatima's gentle embrace grew tighter. At first, this made Arjun smile, but as she continued to squeeze, Arjun's fear returned. Her nails dug into his skin and his bones began to creak. Arjun screamed in pain. Arjun's father ran into the room just as Fatima began to transform. Her eyes turned yellow and her skin separated into scales as it turned a shiny black. The woman's hair fused together into a hooded shape. And finally, the hand squeezing Arjun's hand tighter and tighter became her tail. She writhed before them. Her transformation back into a giant cobra was now complete. You killed my husband. You and your family will pay, she hissed. Her head then snapped forward like lightning and bit into Arjun. Her fangs sunk into him, but released only a small amount of venom, just enough to render him immobile. Arjun watched helplessly as the giant cobra whipped her tail around his father's legs and pulled the man hard to the floor. The cobra made a pleased hiss as she slowly dragged Arjun's begging and screaming father across the floor towards her fearsome maw. Her cobra head rose above Arjun's father and his eyes widened. Her first strike was to his juggler, ripping flesh and veins apart. Arjun's father gasped for sounds he could no longer make as she swallowed his windpipe. She then struck his stomach ripping his organs, sending them flying through the house. And finally, while Arjun watched his father struggle with consciousness, Fatima punctured the patriarch's eyes with her fangs and released her poison into his brain. Tears streamed down Arjun's paralyzed face. Soon, the poison would wear off and he would be left there alone with his dead father in a lifetime of guilt. The Ichhad Hari Nagin slithered from the farmhouse and found her way to her mate. She coiled up next to its lifeless body and looked into its dead eyes again, where she then saw the image of its killer, Arjun, slowly fade away. The cobra Fatima looked to the raging heavens above her and said, I'm ready. Her serpentine gods heard her plea and a bolt of lightning surged through the sky and struck her down. She took her last earthly breath, joining her mate in the afterlife, where the two lovers could be together forever. Have you heard that the flavored air category is quickly becoming the leading alternative to vaping and smoking? It's a whole new movement towards better habits led by the sponsor of today's video, Fume. 
Flavored air isn't like vaping. If vapor was compared to soda, fume cores are closer to herbal teas. Fume has lots of delicious flavors to choose from, like crisp mint and orange vanilla, which I personally always go for the orange vanilla. It's really good. With flavored air, you can satisfy your oral fixation through a passive diffusion system that utilizes no electronics, vapor, or combustion. Fume has served over 300,000 customers, and you can be the next success story. For a limited time, use my code SCARY to get a free gift with your journey pack. Head to tryfume.com, that's tryfum.com, and use code SCARY, or scan the QR code on screen to get a free gift with your order today. Thanks so much for listening. Like and share if this video gave you the chills. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. See you next time.